Hey, what's up? Wes here. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Now, I'm a huge Ghostbusters fan, and if you're anything like me, you have absolutely zero interest in the new Ghostbusters movie. So, I don't know if it was a race thing or a lady thing, but I'm mad as hell. I hear you, Leslie, but I think it's more of a cheap, shameless cash-in thing. Like Key Lime Slime Twinkies. So instead of shelling out hard-earned cash for this knockoff Ghostbusters flick, let's take a look at one of the better games to represent the original franchise. Ghostbusters on the Sega Genesis. Like most kids that grew up in the 80s, I was a huge fan of Ghostbusters. The movie frightened me at times, but on the same token, made me laugh my freaking ass off. He slimed me. Soon afterwards, an excellent cartoon adaptation hit the boob tube, its enchanting siren song calling me to its belly, causing a divot to be entrenched within the floor in front of my obese square-shaped friend. I watched the real Ghostbusters after school and on Saturday mornings religiously like some brainwashed, devout, pious nut. It was one of my favorites. How cool would it be to play a Ghostbusters video game, I often asked myself. Eventually, Activision released a game for the NES. What a piece of trash. I think this is when I first realized that anything with the name Activision on it is absolute shite. Which I found surprising since I was a big Pitfall fan. There was also an arcade version made by Data East. I really didn't care for it either. So by the time 1990 rolled around, I had pretty much lost all hope for a good Ghostbusters adaptation, and the non-existent game that I had been fantasizing about in my head had become fuzzy and indecipherable. But lo and behold, Sega released a Ghostbusters game for the Genesis that abandoned the awful gameplay of the NES version and brought us a more than welcome platformer with nifty visuals that resembled the 1984 film. Although it states this nowhere in the game whatsoever, Ghostbusters, according to several sources on the internet, and even GameSack themselves, was developed by Compile, who were mainly known for creating exceptional shooters back in the day, such as Gunnack and Musha. The intro shows the three Ghostbusters that star in the game, and... Wait a minute. There's not three Ghostbusters. There's four. What the hell? Where's Winston? Well, maybe he's in there, let's just start the game and... Dude! No Winston! Okay, I gotta address something here. What the hell is up with Winston getting the shaft? This dates all the way back to 1984, when movie posters of the Ghostbusters displayed the three founding WHITE members of the team, while the black guy is inconspicuously absent. Yeah, Winston didn't join the Ghostbusters until later in the movie, and maybe the movie posters only displayed the three founding members for spoiler reasons, but damn it, Winston is a Ghostbuster and should get the recognition that he deserves. I mean, he was obviously hired because he could do the job. If there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. It's not like the Ghostbusters have a Rooney rule in place. He was the best man for the job and he earned it. Even the real Ghostbusters has Winston in it. Hell! By the time the sequel rolled around in 1989, the movie posters for IT displayed all four members of the Ghostbusters team. This game was released one year later, so what's the deal? Maybe Sega didn't want to pay Ernie Hudson royalties to use his likeness. Whatever the reason is... It stinks! Anyway, back to the game. So we have the option of three Ghostbusters to choose from, each with their own strengths and deficiencies. Peter Venkman is the most balanced character, with average speed and strength. Ray is the strongest of the three, but also the slowest. And Egon is the opposite, excelling in quickness, but lacking in physical strength. Maybe that's why Winston was left out. As an African American, Winston would without a doubt possess superior speed and strength over the other three scientists, therefore rendering the game too easy. That makes sense. It's still bullshit, though. So Ray has always been my favorite Ghostbuster, and thankfully, he's also my favorite to use in the game. Sure, Peter is the most balanced of the three, but honestly, stamina trumps speed in every way here, 
basically rendering Egon useless, unless you're looking to challenge yourself, that is. And let me just say that this game is challenging enough. After choosing your desired Ghostbuster, the game begins with a call from a desperate would-be client, pleading for you to rid her infested home of pesky ghosts. Using a small map, you are then able to navigate the Ghostbusters to one of four different stages, a la Mega Man, to begin your Spectre Exterminating Crusade. From the onset, Ghostbusters displays a colorful environment full of moving and stationary platforms littered with vibrant creative spooks just waiting to dig their claws into our heroic protagonists. The Ghostbuster characters themselves are miniature shaped with oversized heads that resemble bobbleheads or candy apples. The likenesses of the Ghostbusters do somewhat resemble the real life actors who portray them, which as a youngster I always thought was pretty damn cool. Equipped with a proton pack capable of weapon upgrades, your character is able to fire in five different directions, not to mention the ability to crawl along the floor and fire in the same direction without turning around. In this aspect, the game does share some similarities with run and gun games such as Contra, although with slightly less responsive controls. This may not seem prevalent by just viewing the gameplay, but I assure you that the jumps can be a bit tricky, and I often find myself standing up while trying to crawl and strafe while fighting bosses. Each stage requires you to defeat and capture at least two unique mid-bosses before concluding the stage with a main boss fight. These bosses are cleverly hidden and spaced throughout the stage, which requires you to jump, climb, and even sometimes drop to new areas in search of these elusive apparitions. By pressing start, you have access to a subscreen which contains a map similar to the one used in the Labyrinth of Kid Icarus, coloring in the squares of areas you've already visited. By the process of elimination, this map should help you in finding the fiendish phantoms. The mid-bosses are exceptionally creative, consisting of baddies with the likes of a well-dressed specter in a top hat, a reptilian-looking beast encased within a shell, and a crystal phantom, just to name a few. Once the mid-bosses have been extinguished, the ghost possessing its physical form is liberated only to be captured within the traps that the Ghostbusters so famously round up their ghouls in. Pulling the ghost into the trap can be extremely tricky, becoming a tug of war, and if you're unable to trap the ghost within a certain amount of time, it will fly away, costing the Ghostbusters much needed cash. We'll cover the monetary aspect of the game in just a minute here. Successfully trap the ghost, and you're then greeted with the really nifty graphic of your current Ghostbuster holding up the smoking trap in triumph. We came, we saw, we kicked its ass! Once the mid-bosses have been defeated, the location of the end boss will appear on the map, and the final battle of the stage is able to commence. Once you're able to earn some dough, you can then leave the stage and return to Ghostbusters HQ at any time, where you can buy items and weapons from a shop. New weapons and upgrades can be purchased, which is an essential part of the game, such as the three-way shot. Ghostbusters is fairly difficult, and without upgraded weapons, nearly impossible. Weapons run on a limited supply of juice, but luckily that meter can be upgraded as well. Helpful items can also be purchased, such as bombs or the full energy replenishing turkey, which is literally a lifesaver. You begin Ghostbusters with three lives, and once they've all been exhausted, the game is over. You do have a limited supply of continues, ten to be exact, and while that may seem like a lot, each and every one of them will be useful here. Your progress is not interrupted by continuing, so if you've already defeated a mid-boss, when you continue, they remain vanquished. Thank God! Now while Ghostbusters for the most part is pretty to look at, the music, while good, isn't anything to upload onto your iPod or anything. As a kid, I thought the music was fantastic, but playing it again with adult ears, I don't share the same opinion as my naive younger self. Honestly, I think back then, any 16-bit music would have impressed me. I mean, hey, the Genesis was the most powerful home console at the time. If you're looking for a challenging adventure, you found one right here. All six stages are fairly large, with each subsequent stage bigger than the last, and the baddies only get stronger and more vicious as the game progresses. 
The boss battles can be fairly challenging, and utilizing special weapons, shields, and turkeys against these gruesome foes is paramount in assuring victory. The controls, I feel, add to the difficulty, as they can at times be a bit quirky, but not enough so that you won't be able to adapt to them after just a few plays. The main draw for me is that this is the first Ghostbusters game that was actually half decent, and that the characters resemble the cast from the original source material. The level layouts aren't too difficult to navigate, especially with the map, but that sure as hell doesn't mean the game is easy. I was never able to finish this game back in the day, and one of the reasons was because of suffering from carpal tunnel syndrome. Seriously, I recommend using a turbo controller. You have to fire so often and the bosses absorb ridiculous amounts of damage that it's one of the obstacles that impedes you from completing the game. But I assure you, Ghostbusters is still a hell of a challenge even with Turbo Fire. So overall, the game that I thought was the absolute shit as a preteen isn't nearly as cool now as I had remembered. I bought this game 10 years ago and was so unimpressed that I hadn't played it again. Until now. Giving it another go, I did enjoy it, but honestly, it's a pretty average game. If you're a hardcore Ghostbusters fan, then I would call it a must own, but for the casual gamer slash collector, I'd have to say, play at your own discretion. The price has gotten a little ridiculous over the years, and frankly, in my opinion, has surpassed what it's actually worth. But hey, at the time, it was still the best Ghostbusters game to be released based off of the original franchise, so that's worth something, right?